You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. If you'd like to learn more about the Bearded Theologians, you can go online at beardedtheologians.com, where we have past podcasts, blogs, and a couple items for sale. So check us out, beardedtheologians.com. Thank you for listening, and enjoy this week's show. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. And we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, we have Brian Brian McLaren with us. Um, you'll know him from a lot of books and, um, you know, just <laughs> whether it's Why Did Jesus, Moses, uh, Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road, or his new book, Faith After Doubt, um, and also a podcast, Learning How to See, uh, that's come out in the last uh, few months. Uh, Brian, thanks for being on. Um, would you tell tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, well, first, I want to say, as a bald theologian, I'm really glad to be with bearded theologians. And I, for most we all of my have life, similar haircuts, right? Hey, <laughs> for most of my life, I had a beard too. But anyway, great, great to be with you guys. Yeah, I, uh, I've lived on the East Coast my whole life. I was born in New York, lived most of my life uh, for a little while in Illinois, most of my life in Maryland, and then for the last 12 years down here in Southwest Florida. I live right at the edge of the Everglades, uh, right on the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And um, I started my career as a college English teacher, and um, then I helped start a, a little church, experimental church in the Washington, D.C. area, and ended up becoming a pastor there. I was a pastor for 24 years at the same church. During that time, I started writing books, and for the last uh, 16 years, I have been a, uh, a writer, and I speak a lot to clergy, and um, and... Yeah, uh, of course, with COVID, uh, all of my speaking has been been via Zoom, and I've been speaking to all kinds of amazing people uh, through Zoom. Well, we're super glad to have you on. Um, I, I know you don't remember this by any means, but I got to meet you a handful of years ago uh, at the Perkins School of Youth Ministry. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I did a little gig there and had a blast. I have, I have uh, great memories of that time. Yeah, Kevin yeah. Alton uh, was one of the organizers of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a good, good for uh, formational time in my life, you know. And right. we're working with youth, and and now working with the the full church. It's been, it's been fun. Been. Yeah. So, uh, so tell us a little bit. You got a a new book out called Faith After Faith After Doubt. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about that. Well, um, a whole lot of people. Uh, I, I imagine you meet them too, especially in youth youth ministry, but really people of all ages are. Uh, are basically coming to pastors and friends and others and saying, I just don't think I can be a Christian anymore. This thing doesn't make sense to me. I'm having doubts. Occasionally, when they admit to having doubts and questions, they find people who, especially if they have a good youth pastor, who say, well, tell me about that. And they listen and they help them think it through and they create a safe environment. But a whole lot of people are still told, well, you've just got to believe or you're on a slippery slope or you better work this out or you're going to hell. All things which just drive a person even farther and farther away. And, and I feel this especially uh, on, on many levels. But, you know, I was one of those kids myself. I, I when I was a teenager, I had so many questions and I went through a deep period of doubt in high school and then more in college. And. And when I became a pastor, maybe naively, I thought all of those problems would go away. But I find out, I found that so many pastors have deep, deep questions and very often don't feel there's a safe place for them to go to, to talk about those questions. And um, so my own life, I feel this, but in my 24 years as a pastor, I so often would have people come and say, listen, you may kick me out of the church after this, but I need to tell you, I don't believe this. This doesn't make sense to me. And um, they weren't really asking me to make it make sense. Um, they were basically just saying, no, I've heard, in fact, I remember one guy said to me, Brian, I've been coming to this church every Sunday for six months, and I've already heard you talk about the thing that's bothering me. So um, it, unless you have something to tell me that you aren't telling people on Sunday, <laughs> I just want you to know that that doesn't make sense to me. So there's a lot of people in that, in that situation. And and because I have a special place in my heart for pastors, um, the, the number of Catholic priests and pastors and bishops and uh, others who, they're, they're human beings and they go through things in their life. Sometimes, as you guys, I'm sure know, 
when you see behind the curtain of what goes on in the religious world, sometimes it's even harder to keep your faith in the pastorate. So it's for all of those people that I really wanted to write this book. So I've been, uh, I picked it up uh, last night um, and really just enjoyed diving into it and found myself thinking, um, wow, I, I've either been there or been with, uh, have sat with people uh, who are going through these difficult situations and, you know, being in the, um, the brunt of the Bible belt, I hear, like, I definitely have heard those conversations of, you know, I was doubting my pastor on this and I came to him and he just told me to believe or I'm going to hell. And I mean, I, I mean, I actually just had a phone conversation with a man uh, the other day about this uh, kind of the same deal where he was struggling with the way that his former faith community responded to his father's death uh, due to COVID and they were not very uh, scientific uh, yeah. based faith. And so like they, um, they, I mean, just as bad as they were, I finally said, you know, if it's causing you harm, it's not worth it. And I mean, I just, you know, I just, um, you know, as I was reading through this, I could just hear some of those conversations I've had over my last uh, 20 plus years of ministry of, of people wrestling with doubt. And even myself in the times that I've had to, um, you know, go through those moments of um, uh, questioning what I believe. And, and even, you know, seminaries, you know, seminary will do that to you in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, you know, I found myself landing in places that I'd never expected because, you know, either I doubted and, and realized and came back to something new, or I found a new direction that was even healthier. Yes. Yes. My goodness. Uh, that says it so well, you know, you mentioned the Bible belt and I don't want to violate anybody's privacy here, but years ago I had a friend who was in, I'll just say in Tennessee and they, um, they did some research on church attendance rates. And I don't know if this is still true because this is probably eight or 10 years ago, but then the lowest church attendance rate in the country was the Pacific Northwest. Um, but when they looked at the percentage of uh, people under, I think, it was, I think it was 18 to 28, I think that was the rate, they had uh, equal or higher rate of teenagers and, uh, and young adults who were disconnected from church in this area of Tennessee. And most of these were kids who grew up and by the time they got, they turned 12 or 14 or 16, they were out of there. And, um, and I think people don't realize how big a struggle it is for many young people and not just young people, older people too, um, in, especially in the Bible Belt. Absolutely, that's, that's something I've seen uh, I grew up in Texas, served there, served in New Mexico, served in Montana and now Wyoming. And yeah, see, see a lot of that, especially in the last, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years, more and more people hitting that spot and just, you know what, I'm done. Yes. Uh, this, this isn't for me. And, and I, I argue with people quite a bit and I, and I may be wrong, but I don't think the church is declining as quickly as we'd like to think it is now. I just think people are willing to say, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I don't believe yes. that. And I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to try yes. to save face uh, and tell you I do go somewhere where really I don't. Um, yes. I think we just have more people being honest about where they are spiritually and, and finding so, so many people willing to say, uh, especially once they, you know, find out you're a pastor. Um, I, I'm getting less and less. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I haven't been to church in so long to, you know, I, I had a rough go. And, uh, it, and it's just hard. Um, and, and I couldn't find anybody that I connected with or community I connected with and there was something happened. And now I, I just had to walk away, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm finding a lot more of just people being honest. Uh, I, I think you're so right, Zach. I, you know, I just had this realization the other day. I'm writing the sequel to this book, Faith After Doubt Now, which is just called Do I Stay Christian? And mm -hmm. I, I realized it's funny. I should have seen this a long time ago, but I didn't. Um, I used to think that people we might call nominal Christians, right? In Christian in name only. I used to think they were just people who didn't care. Mm. Um, but I'm coming to think now a lot of them are people who had questions and doubts and who were disappointed in what they saw. And they want to hang in there and still call themselves Christian. Right. But nothing has won their heart. Nothing has proven trustworthy over the long haul. So I, I think, and then as you say, and a whole lot of those people eventually just get to the point of saying, yeah, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> it's over. Right. Yeah. Um, 
And, and, and I think a lot of it comes through, you know, we, when we talk about doubt in the church, we, we don't talk about it as a faithful act. Yes. Um, I love to take Thomas and, and rather than naming him doubting Thomas and, and letting him live into that of, no, no, really he's faithful and, and we've given him a bad rap and he's he really should be faithful Thomas um, because he had the goal, you know, he had the courage to be like, I don't, I, I need to see it. <laughs> I need to touch it. I, I need this. Um, and that the doubt that he has isn't, isn't bad. And in fact, it's one of the most faithful things that we can express Oh my goodness! Uh, in our spirituality, that's so. Well so said. many get up there and they're just like, "No, if you doubt, you're you're out. You know, you're not you're not good enough." You know, because I've been talking to a lot of uh, groups via Zoom and other other platforms about this book. I've had several people bring up Thomas. Sure. And uh, and I realized I just hadn't gone back and really read the text in a while, and I went back and just read it closely. And the first thing that hit me is. Jesus doesn't say, damn you, Thomas, you're a doubter. Blessed the people who believe. He says, blessed are you, you have seen and believed. And blessed are those who have not seen. And it's this sort of equalizing statement to just say, and to me, you can't read that when you put it in the whole context. You can't read that without saying the reason this story is included is not to shame doubters, but to say that they're welcome in our, in our community. In fact, right. people often say doubting Thomas, but at the end of Matthew, when the disciples encounter the risen Christ, um, it says they worshiped him and some doubted. And it's just like some worship, some doubt. It's it <laughs> right. Right. And you're right. It's that, that equalization of it's here. We're, here's where these folks are in their faith journey and they're, yeah. they're seeing it, they're living it. Right. And they still need that, that little bit. Um, but I think we gloss over the, uh, you know, here's this level playing field, if you yeah. will, for bad metaphor. Right. Um, yeah. But everybody's there and wherever yeah. you are in those moments, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, just be there, be present. That's right. Well, and I think that. that that's where that pulling back the, I call it the third grade uh, Sunday school felt stories and pulling them yeah. back and deconstructing them and, and seeing that there was more there than what we ever recognized or, yes. you know, we were not taught. I mean, that's something that um, I've got, I've got two young kids and that's something that we've really worked hard on is making sure that they see all of the story of the scripture and not just, you know, we stop when Noah gets off the boat and everything's great. Like, no, like they need to hear the rest of the story that like, you know, yes. that he went on a bender and like he had other problems that came up along the way. And like, you know, and, and I think far too often we hold on to that. And when that gets deconstructed, whether in a sermon or somewhere else, we don't know what to do with that because the church has never done a good job of saying like that whole, that creating a space, a brave space to say, it's okay to question us. It's okay to say like, I don't get this, or it's not speaking to me. What do I do with this? You know, we've just said, um, we really have said repent and believe. I mean, that's really, yes. um, yes. you know, the way that, you know, um, and I didn't even grow up in the faith. So it's not something that I grew up with. Um, but what I'm noticing now as a pastor is those people pulling back that, that felt and seeing that there was more to the story or, yeah. um, and so what do I do with that? You know, and these are people in their sixties and seventies. They're like, I didn't realize this was there. Or, um, we did two years ago, we went through the, um, uh, the church I was the church I'm in right now, we went through the book of revelation and how many people were just amazed at the book itself because they, yeah. you know, uh, definitely where we're at in Oklahoma, like it's a whole different presentation of what that book really means in some spaces. And so people brought that to the table with them and helping them. I think when the, 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 the thing that the church I feel has done the worst is not bringing, allowing people to have a space to question it or to say like, um, but then also like pastors, us as pastors, you know, we're, we're told, you know, it, it, to tell them it's okay that, you know, you may not have the answer, like, like, let me research it or something like that. But like, how many times have we found ourselves in that position, like, where we feel like we have to answer, because if not, it's going to put those people in a worse space. And, oh my. and, and that's where I think that that idea of creating a space of doubt, like I was, as I was reading through this, like, I was just kind of scanning it to see like, man, this might, this is probably going to be a really good sermon series type or uh, book study conversation with some of my people, because this is where they're at. And they need, they need to see that that's okay. Even though I tell them every Sunday, it's okay to unpack this, you know, and we try to, you know, create as much space as possible, but it's, you know, it's still worship and, you know, trying to get people to those next places is that's always the fun part. Yeah. I, 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 I think the conversation centered around pastors and doubt 
because we're supposed to have it all together, right? We're supposed to have not not only have all the answers, but to be in that space where, you know, we're almost walking hand in hand with Jesus because that's how, at least on the outside, that's what it's supposed to be. Um, and yet we, you said it, we're, we're human just like everybody else. And yeah, sometimes the, an, you know, the answer of, I, I don't know, but I'll find out is, is a good one. But the other time, you know, to share that space of, yeah, this sucks and it's hard and I really don't know. And I'm, I'm there with you. Let's, let's journey together. Now I'm going to go try to read all the things I can to get you, get you an answer, but let's just be there uh, yeah. together um, in kind of the ashes and sackcloth of, of what, you know, humanity and being human is. Um, and that's been freeing, freeing for me in the last couple of years uh, in, in just kind of sitting in that space of, not only does this suck, I just don't know what to do with it. And yes. uh, that's okay. You know, the, those three words you just said, I don't know. Uh, you know, this is one of the incredible, like, this is what faith is about. Faith mm-hmm. is how we live, knowing that there are things we don't know, knowing there are things we know that we're probably wrong about, and knowing that there are things we will never be able to know because we're just too little to, mm-hmm. to figure it out. And uh, isn't it weird that somehow the word faith got equated with beliefs and beliefs got equated with certainty so that for a lot of people, faith means pretending you're certain. Mm. And, uh, and that's just so far from, uh, from what I think we actually find. I, I remember one of my favorite chapters when I was a pastor, I, I preached through the book of Romans once. And I remember uh, when I got to Romans chapter four, that became one of my favorite chapters. I almost memorized the whole thing uh, for a while, but um, uh, because in Romans, it says, uh, it has this beautiful phrase, Abram, Abraham is lifted up as the father of faith. Um, uh, and it says, in hope against hope, he believed. Uh, he, he faced that his body was as good as dead, yet he believed the promise. So it's not like, he psyched himself into ignoring that he was impotent, but he faced the realities and still held on. And what hit me about that is that Abraham had no theology. Judaism didn't exist yet. Christianity didn't exist yet. There were no Bibles, nothing even close. All that he had is some set of experiences that told him, I want you to leave everything you're familiar with, your father's house, your culture in, in Chaldea. And I want you to go to a place and I'm not even going to tell you what it is. Like everything about it was a journey into the unknown. Right. And oh my gosh, when faith is pretending you're certain about things, that's not much of an adventure. But when faith is, I, I'm being drawn into the unknown. Man, that's, that's to me, uh, it's not always comfortable, but it's honest and livable. It, it sounds like being, and livable, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like being um, more in tune with the Holy Spirit, um, and I think that's something we're preaching a sermon series on the Holy Spirit right now, and that's kind of been my thing. Is like you know, I don't think we're listening to the Holy Spirit enough, yeah. Um, and we're holding on to Jesus or we're holding on to God, but we really haven't embraced the Spirit, and you know that to me that's a mainline problem in some ways, <laughs> um, but. Um, you know, that whole idea of just really being in tune with, with the spirit and where it's leading you and guiding you, man, when you do that, it, it can, uh, it'll mess with you, but I think it will, it will lead you to where you're supposed to be. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I just have a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some, some about the guitars behind you and more about uh, everything we're talking about, you know, um, man, where to well, even go can ahead. I just, can I tell you a quick story that Please. Matt, your, your comment comes to mind. You know, one of the problems in, in belief is that sometimes there are, sometimes there are things we wish were true and we try to turn the, and, and what we wish were true, we decide that's what God told me is true. Right. Um, and Years ago when I was a pastor, there was a woman, her name was Cindy. She came to our church. Um, she had no religious background and she'd come to faith and she was growing in her faith. 
And then she started getting involved at a, a Pentecostal church down the street. And they told her, claim your promise, claim it in the name of Jesus, and it will be yours. So her husband was in the military and he was stationed overseas. And she uh, came to me one day and she said, I've claimed a promise that my husband will be back by Christmas. I don't want to go through another Christmas without him. I miss him so much. I've claimed in the name of Jesus that he's coming back. And I want to ask you if you'll claim it with me. And um, I remember just feeling like I don't want to discourage her. I don't want to discourage her faith, but I've not seen these things turn out well, you know? And I remember feeling really torn. And finally I said, look, Cindy, I know this is really meaningful for you. And I want to promise you, if your husband comes back by Christmas, I will celebrate with you. I said, but rather than claiming this with you, I just want to prepare you that he might not come back by Christmas. And, you know, God still loves you and everything doesn't depend on this. And she was so upset with me. She was so disappointed with me. But of course he didn't, I, well, I shouldn't say of course, but it turned out he did not come back at Christmas. Right. And, right. and then we had to have this conversation to try to pick up the pieces, you know. And, and this is where when people give people easy answers, um, they, they think they're helping them, you know, but my gosh, they can do damage. And, and so I felt I sort of had an obligation to this woman as her pastor to prepare her for reality. Um, I, I have a, a, a friend I admire so much. He's a Catholic uh, writer and theologian named James Finley. And James says something that really upsets people. He says, God protects us from nothing and is with us in everything. Yeah. And when he says that, people get angry at him. They start quoting Bible verses to him. And, um, and here's what he says. He says, when I was a boy, my father viciously abused me, viciously, hatefully abused me. And I prayed every day that my father would change until his last breath, he hated me and was vicious to me. And he said, while that preacher is quoting the verse that God will protect you, there's a little girl being abused and there's a little child being beaten up. And, and, and if you aren't honest about the realities uh, that some people experience, he said, then you're pouring salt into the wounds of these people who are already so wounded. And I, and, and then he goes on to say what he means when he says that God is with us in everything. Um, and, uh, and at any rate, I just think that's a kind of honesty that when I hear him say that, I just think in a way, I, that's what I was trying to say to this woman many years ago. Um, I don't, I didn't have, I wasn't as eloquent as, uh, or maybe as bold as James is. Well, and I, I find myself struggling when, when, and maybe this is where the years of experience help you uh, do that so much softer than, than <laughs> I tend to, because uh, my, my default answer is, yeah, I don't think that's how that works. Uh, <laughs> and there's a way better pastoral answer, which you gave us. Um, and, and, you know, even when you're, you know, we find it a lot when, when folks are mourning or when they come hurt yes. and, um, and, and we, we say, we say the right things. We say the things that we, we believe are true. Like, you know, God's, God's there with you, right? Yeah. Uh, through all of these things. And sometimes we just don't know. All of that truly became a reality for me uh, when my mother-in-law passed away uh, a couple of years ago, uh, fighting cancer, you know, at, at 67. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, all of those things that I ever told people in those pastoral moments just hit me like, I've said these things and I hope they make them feel better. They don't make me feel better at all right now. Uh, but it was just that constant reminder for me of it. God, God's there. God's present there. Where, where can I slow down enough and, and be present enough to find that space um, and just, just sit in it for a little bit uh, as hard and uncomfortable as that is. And it's, it's reshaped. Uh, I still, you know, try to try to share that stuff with with folks in those moments of grief, but uh, it it comes out different now. Yes. Uh, now that there's a little bit more lived and shared experience in it, uh, you know, it just it hits different. Uh, yes. It hits more home with me. Uh, I I tend to relive 
that grief with them rather than being able to do the really unhealthy thing and compartmentalize, right? <laughs> There's something to be said for, for that. Beautifully said. Yeah. Well, um, man, I could do this all day. Uh, <laughs> He's very, uh, Brian's very soothing and I feel better about things right now. Just I listening know. to what he has said <laughs> after a long day in the office. It's definitely been kind of a nice uh, uh, pick me up to, to hear yeah. uh, some of the things. Well, let me, let me put you on the spot for a second. Um, what have you seen in the last 16 months uh, it, within the church, within culture, within the community, where, wherever, What's, what's different today than it was even two years ago, but especially, you know, this time last year. So here in the U S I think we're on the verge of a reckoning and, and the reckoning uh, is, is about our, our deep history of white supremacy. Um, And, and this white supremacy doesn't just go back to, you know, the civil war or even the slavery era. It actually has theological roots that go back into the 15th century a lot of people don't know about this, but um, there was a, a Pope, uh, Pope Nicholas V, who issued a, um, a document that was called the Doctrine of, Dis- it's later called the Doctrine of Discovery. Its original title was Dom Diversus. And it was basically a call to the kings of Europe to go into all the world and make slaves of all the nations in the name of Jesus. And it's an ugly, ugly part of Christian history that unleashed the colonial era. And I didn't even know such a thing existed probably till I was in my fifties. I had never even heard of it. Um, Now more and more people are hearing about it, but it was this well-kept secret and Protestants picked it up. In fact, the doctrine of discovery is in the uh, declaration of independence. It's referred to uh, in the declaration of independence as one of the reasons that the colonies wanted to break away from King George. He was, he was getting in the way of the doctrine of discovery that allowed them to steal the lands of the native peoples and so on. So this is deeply, deeply embedded in America and it's deeply, deeply embedded in American Christianity. And, and after, you know, the, the, obviously, you, you know, you grow up hearing about the civil war and you grow up hearing about slavery and there's a certain almost, callousness or cavalierness that white Christians uh, end up feeling about it. But when you really let it sink in, and it often helps when I'm with my Native American friends, but, and a lot of people don't know that before the African trade slave, there was a slave trade, there was a big slave trade of Native Americans, um, that, uh, well, that, 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 our whole, our whole Christian experience in the United States, with very few exceptions, has been about defending that kind of white supremacy. And here's the trick, it's white Christian supremacy. Mm-hmm. And so, and you know, when I write about faith and doubt, I think white Christian supremacy is one of the things that needs to be doubted. And I think our history is one of the things that needs to be challenged. And I think we have to have a desire to know the truth, even if the truth hurts. And, uh, and what I think we've seen over this last year, I mean, you know, with George Floyd having a, a policeman's neck on his knee and, and the world watching, uh, obviously George Floyd was no threat. And obviously there were things going on here that just make absolutely no sense. And it just feels like every day there's, you know, every week there's a couple more of these episodes I think we're at the moment where we could have a reckoning, but here's what I'm worried about. I'm worried that uh, a lot of people are more committed to the Fox news of Rupert Murdoch than they are to the good news of Jesus Christ. And they're getting their information from cable news and from radio, uh, you know, talk show hosts, and sadly a whole line of radio preachers who just back up the things that are said by this sort of, right-wing media machine. And, uh, and I'm sure I'm upsetting some people by saying this, but I'm, I'm just, it, I, I'm, I, I could be wrong, but so could the person who's angry at me right now. Right. Um, and, and, but what I think we have the chance to do now is for more of us to be willing to question our history and get serious about saying we'd like to do better going forward. 
Um, and, and the answer isn't to beat ourselves up and hate ourselves or anything, but the answer is to just face the truth. And then to say, knowing what we now know, what needs to change, how, how do we move forward? Obviously, Wyoming has a history of this. Oklahoma has a history of this, but I live in Southwest Florida. More people were lynched after the Civil War in Florida per capita than any other state. And uh, I, I have a friend who's a, he's a Methodist pastor in Texas. And a few years ago, he, he'd never known this, but the town that he lives in, little town in Texas, found out that two brothers were lynched in his town. And then he found out that the people who did the lynching were members of his church. And so, you know, one thing led to another. He met some African-American pastors, found out that those two men being lynched resulted in 3,000 African-Americans fleeing for their lives. Because then you see that lynching wasn't just an act of violence against two people. It was an act of violence to scare away all the people. Mm -hmm. And so 3,000 people moved to Chicago and, you know, uh, and Cincinnati and other places. And so this pastor had the courage he got together, he's white, got together with a couple black pastors. They found the descendants of the two men who were lynched. And they invited them down to Texas and they had a service of honoring them and lamenting the injustice that was done. And I just thought, man, that's, that's Christianity uh, acting as it should rather than sweeping things under the carpet. Mm -hmm. Which is what a, a lot of what we like to do, right? And, and you're right, just ignore it of uh, what not. Uh, yeah. And and one of my favorite things in seminary was was that conversation of, hey, as the church, just in general, we have a pretty shitty history. Um, <laughs> we've done some really shitty things, but let's acknowledge that and, and like yeah. say, get better. Uh, let's quit living into the the things we did. Yeah. And pretending we're not still living into them yeah. uh, end of, you know, the privilege into the, the benefits into just that, that history of, well, you know, and that was a long time ago. Yeah. It really wasn't. Uh, it That's really right. wasn't. And, you know, um, um, I, I know different people are different. Some people, when they write a book, they know everything they want to say. But when I write a book, I usually have a question or a problem mm -hmm. and I figure out what I want to say as I'm writing it, which mm -hmm. means I throw away an awful lot of what I write, but I, it's a learning process. And when I got to the end of this book, Faith After Doubt, this realization had me, it's so obvious, but I realized a whole lot of what I doubted was supremacy, yeah. was Christian supremacy, which has white Christian supremacy hidden under, underneath the surface. And I realized Jesus didn't have supremacy. Jesus didn't come around saying, I'm the greatest. He came around saying, I'm a servant. Yeah. And I realized that if, if it took doubt to help me purge, begin to purge my faith of any kind of supremacy, um, then uh, the way I say it at the end of the book is blessed be doubt, um, because it, 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 it freed me, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it, and not that I'm totally freed. Obviously, I keep encountering, you know, my, my misconceptions all the time. But but it continues to give you permission to, to question it, even the things that you feel certain of, right? Uh, it, it gives that space to go, well, today, you know, am I certain of this today? If something happened to reshape uh, yes. my, my thoughts, my beliefs, my understanding of what this particular thing is. Um, and I think you're right. If, if we continue to go on with faith as pretending that we're certain, right, we're never going to ask any questions. Uh, or we're only going to ask the easy ones. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to ask the ones we need to actually ask and explore the things that are uh, difficult, like our history, or, um, you know, just how did we, how do we get here? Uh, <laughs> you know, wherever here is, um, and really take an honest look at that and, and see how that shaped uh, our faith personally, and, you know, on the bigger scale within denominations and globally and the big church. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it, I, I love that space for permission. Um, in, in anything we do, but especially in our faith of, you know what, I can, I can question this today and that's okay. Um, yeah. And I probably should, because if I'm not, am I ever going to move forward? Is that a needle ever going to move in another direction? Or are we just going to take that easy path and keep doing the same old stuff we've always done? Boy, it, you're reminding me, uh, uh, I, I don't know why this story comes to mind, but some years ago, uh, I, while I was a pastor, I had this friend who was uh, 
you know, not a religious person, but he respected me as a Christian and so on. And he calls me one day and he says, I've got this employee who is a, a, a he said, a born again Christian who is the worst employee I've ever had. And whenever I try to talk to him about his problems on the job, he tells me he's being persecuted for his faith. And he, I said, it's not about his faith. He's just not doing a good job. And he's not willing to listen to anybody who wants to give him some feedback. He said, you're my only pastor friend. I don't want to have to fire this guy. Could I set up an opportunity where you could meet him? I'm going to invite you to this thing with my company and maybe you could help him. So think of this. Here's a, a non-religious boss who's trying to help one of his employees. He cares about the guy. He, you know, he tells me this guy has kids and I don't want to have to fire him. Um, but man, it's, it's not looking good right now. Any chance you could talk to him. So I go to this company event and uh, the, this employee meets me and says, oh, I'm so happy to meet a man of God. Great to meet you. And then he pulls me aside and he starts, and he starts bad mouthing his boss. And he starts creating this little alliance, like we're both Christians. And so we're, we're with God. And my boss is such a bad person. And I just remember feeling like I wanted to take a shower. I was being sucked into this little exclusive elite superior group. And, and that's one of the things that I think a whole lot of people don't want to be part of that. You know, mm -hmm. they, and, and when you think about it, that's what Jesus was about. Jesus is, was saying, look, if you want to stone a woman caught in adultery, if you're without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. I want to protect her. I don't want to attack her. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, the sick and the lepers and all, and uh, Samaritans and all the rest all of his movement was towards solidarity rather than supremacy. Mm -hmm. and you, you, I always think of the story of, you know, the woman at the well, right? Uh, they often would go around Samaria, but Jesus takes them through. And not only does he sit down at the well, he talks to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, which, you know, it, it's that completely breaking down that barrier that what Jesus is doing is for just a certain group of people, but it's yes. for, it's for everybody. And he starts not only with the Samaritan, but with the Samaritan woman. Uh, and you're right, just building that solidarity and completely changing and reframing what the disciples understood, what the people around them understood, you know, everything to be. And he, and he just completely flips it and is like, no, no, no this is what we're going to do. <laughs> yes. We're going to go do the really hard thing uh, and completely change everything. And you can see, so when he says to his disciples, follow me, he's not saying, believe a bunch of things about me. He's saying, trust me enough to say, you start living this way. You start talking to people. You, you know, this is a new, a new way of life. Yeah. Which, by the way, returning to this theme of faith and doubt, required them to doubt what their religious leaders had told them. Mm -hmm. um, pretty amazing. Yeah, it does. It, it, yeah, just to drop everything and go, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> We'll follow you. We'll see where this thing goes. Completely reshapes everything they know. Uh, yeah. And you see that in the book of Acts too. Um, when, you know, the their disciples are going and healing people and the religious yeah. authorities are like, you, you know, you don't have that power. You don't have that authority. And like, well, Jesus told us to do it. So like, we're doing it. <laughs> like, yeah. um, just thinking about the, the lectionary text from last week. And just like, I really said, you know, the religious authorities were not happy that these guys were doing the thing that the spirit had instructed them to do. What does that say about us today? And so, you know, I, you know, we live, uh, you know, you, you, you brought up that story of the man. I, I mean, I can't tell you the number of conversations when people find out I'm a pastor, it's like, Oh my gosh, like, this is amazing. We can't do it. Like one, we're not going to say anything. We're not, you know, we're not going to cast in front of you, hide the liquor and, you know, uh, all that stuff. And, you know, usually we're the first ones to the bar, you know, um, you know, and I think that that's where, um, especially when it grows the sides of clergy, you know, like, it's okay to take ourselves off that pedestal that people and really help people not to put us there and say, Hey, that's not who I am. I'm not Jesus. Like I am not Jesus. Um, and I really try to model that obviously, I mean, I'm in a t-shirt and a hat today in my office. So like that, and now it's on a Wednesday. So that tells you exactly how I feel about, you know, this, yes. what I call used car salesman, uh, pastoral <laughs> look that happens. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that that's where it, when we do this, Zach and I are both similar in this, that 
we like to be in a space where people will feel comfortable with coming to us, but we also want to create a space where people are going to be honest with us and we're going to be honest with them. And, and if we don't know, like, I mean, I, I've even both of, I've seen both of us do this. Or I've, I've seen Zach do it. And I know he's seen me do it. Like just telling people like, Hey, we don't know. Like, and that's okay too. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a great space for people who are doubting to know that there are people of faith who are struggling and it's not, um, it's not this, you know, sunshine and rainbows thing is that, you know, yeah. faith is, faith is a struggle. It's not something yeah. that we can just coast on through. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, years ago I was at this lunch and I was in my twenties and, um, there was some famous Christian leader there and I got to sit next to him. And I don't remember what I said, but I must have been trying to impress him with how much I knew and, you know, all the rest. I'm embarrassed to think what I must have said. Because what, but what I remember is he just looked at me and said, I knew a lot more when I was your age than I know now. That's all he said. <laughs> and, and I remember part of me was like, hold it. You're supposed to be a leader. You're supposed to know more than me. I'm working hard to know everything I can. And he was just happy being himself. And I realized he was just giving me a phenomenal gift. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think I was quite ready to really accept it, but at least I remembered it. And later I realized, I bet what he was trying to tell me is that I sound like an arrogant jerk right now. And I'm trying so hard to impress. And I'm on this treadmill of having to know more and understand more. And he's just saying, eh, none of that really matters um, for, for where I am now. And, uh, yeah, it was a little window for me into something that I, I wasn't there, but I remember thinking, yeah, maybe I'll be there someday. And boy, am I there now. I, <laughs> and what's so beautiful is when you feel my faith doesn't require me to have everything figured out. My faith is the way that I live. Well, the, the way I express it in the book is I, I season on this one little phrase of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, where he says this amazing, absolutely outrageous thing. It's, I'm just surprised this isn't one of the best known verses in the Bible. He says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means a thing. Now, obviously, circumcision sounds pretty weird for us you know, today, but to realize that was the primary boundary marker, who's in and who's out of, of the right religion, right? Um, who's clean and who's unclean. Um, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. It's all meaningless. The only thing that matters, he says, is faith expressing itself in love. And those words to me just are like the portal into a better place. The only thing that matters is faith. And it's not a long list of beliefs. It's faith, trust, that is always expressing itself in love. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I don't often love Paul. Uh, <laughs> our listeners know that I talk a lot of crap. Uh, <laughs> there are times he gets it right. Um, and, and it all, it always makes that makes me think of, uh, Ecclesiastes. You know, we, we always, only thing people know at Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. Right. Yeah. Um, but that, that, that whole book starts out with just this honest confession of the writer saying, I'm just trying to figure this out and it's all pointless. It's just yes. perfectly pointless. Yes. And that has been a, a moniker for me for the, I don't know, the last five or six years of just, hey, it really doesn't matter. What, what we're trying to do here, it, it really, in the end of the day, doesn't matter. It's just, we're trying to figure it out all together. I like and, that, Zach. Yeah. Um, and it sort of takes us back to Thomas. You think Thomas gets included in that gospel story because we need to make room for, for doubters. And my gosh, the book of Ecclesiastes is basically a permission slip to people to say, if you don't know, if you don't believe anything, if you think, if you're questioning everything, if life makes absolutely no sense to you, we don't kick you out. We give you a book in the Bible. <laughs> right, exactly. You get a whole book and, and over and over again, it says, hey, even if you don't get it, it's still pointless. And, and God <laughs> created us to eat, drink and be happy. What more do you want? <laughs> Let's live into that and see how this world is such a different place when we can do that. I, I love that. So, Brian, we want to be respectful of your time because I know, um, you know, you, uh, 
I mean, we could definitely talk for a day. Like this is something we could just have fun for days with. Um, you know, the book, the new book is uh, Faith After Doubt. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners as we uh, kind of bring the, wrap this thing up? Well, I'll, I'll just say one thing maybe in closing as a way of saying thanks to you guys. I, w- I think we all know that there are many people who don't feel it's safe to go to their pastor or go to their church, even go to their parents and say, I'm not so sure about this anymore. I know our church teaches this, but it doesn't make sense to me. And I think one of the ways that people are surviving is through podcasts. And I think podcasts like this one are creating a place you're driving in your car, you're listening to the podcast, you're alone, nobody knows that you're listening and you're able to say, okay, other people are being honest. And so I just wanna thank you guys for having me and thank you for the good work you're doing. Um, it, it's, it, I, think, I think we're, we're creating space for something beautiful and new to be born. Thank you. That's uh, that's certainly what we've set out to attempt to do, and some di- some weeks are better than others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our- going to be a good week. We appreciate your your time and and uh, just authenticity to be here and and be you. Uh, we appreciate that. Thanks. And that was our whole mantra of this podcast is is to model what some honest theological conversation looks like. And there have been times where we've read scripture where we're both. <laughs> Uh, just like that, that just doesn't sound right. You know, we've, we've had some fun times with that. And so, you know, that's, that's, so um, that's something that we've attempted to do. And, you know, we thank you for your time today, Ryan. Um, you know, definitely um, you're more than welcome to come back anytime you have a, a new book, or if you just want to chat some more, we'd be glad to, to, to have you on at any time. Well, thanks um, for reaching out. Keep up the great work and I look you. forward to meet, meeting in person sometime. Of course. Yes. Bye-bye. So for our listeners, so uh, thank you for listening. And uh, for the Bearded Theologians, I'm Matt Franks. I'm Zach Bechtold. Thanks for checking us out. First, guys, I want you to subscribe and like this video. And put that thumb, push that thumbs up. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. You can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.